Welcome. Good evening. Welcome. I'm Margaret Latimer, the Acting Vice President and Provost here at the Montgomery College Germantown campus. It is my great pleasure to welcome you today and introduce you to a successful STEM student. You all know what that means, right? Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. Our Interim Senior Vice President of Academic Affairs, one of the people instrumental in bringing Miss America to Montgomery College, unfortunately cannot be with us as he is busy conducting college business. Dr. Rye has sent three special STEM students in his stead to bring greetings to Miss Davalori. Would Miss Nandita Rye, Miss Savannah Graney, and Miss Afia Obeng please join me at the podium to welcome Miss America. The Miss America organization is one of the nation's leading providers of scholarship assistance for young women. Last year, along with its state and local organizations, they made available more than $45 million in scholarships to young women across the nation. Over 14,000 young women vied for the title of Miss America and the $50,000 scholarship award that goes along with the title. And this past September, in Atlantic City, Nina Davalori, a graduate of the University of Michigan, made her way to the Miss America stage as Miss New York. It was there Nina gained international acclaim by becoming the first contestant of Indian descent to be named Miss America. Over the course of Nina's year of service as Miss America, she will log approximately 20,000 miles per month as she travels the country to address an array of audiences on her platform celebrating diversity through cultural competency. She also serves as the official National Goodwill Ambassador for Children's Miracle Network Hospitals, the national platform partner of the Miss America organization, and advocates for STEM education. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss America 2014, Nina Davalori. This is a letter of our appreciation for visiting us at Germantown. Well, thank you girls so much, and thank you for the warm welcome, everyone. It's such a delight to be here. Um, before um, I, I get started, I just wanted to uh, tell you a little bit about myself, what I'm doing um, as, as Miss America this year, and then open the floor to some question and answers. Um, I'd really like to have this be a, a wonderful discussion, an insightful discussion, and looking forward to having a great conversation. Um, but get a little cozy, because I have you guys for a little while, and you're going to hear my life story, <laughs> like it or not. Um, but with that being said, I was born in Syracuse, New York, um, and then from there, oh yay, yeah, holler, go orange, very rarely I say that. Um, I was born there, and then when I was four, my family moved to Oklahoma, and I actually grew up in a very small, um, small conservative town in Oklahoma, and I think I was the only Indian girl in my classes growing up, and this was really the first time, um, even at that young age, that I realized I was culturally different um, from my peers in my community. And I had so many common um, misconceptions and stereotypes and questions um, from my community and peers. Um, I was often mistaken for Native American. People would always ask me what tribe I'm in. They'd say, what tribe are you in? And I'd say, I don't know, um, because I really didn't. Um, and you know, and other questions um, like, you know, what, what does the red dot mean? Or do you worship cows? Or are you going to have an arranged marriage? And the list, list goes on. Um, but many of these remarks weren't necessarily meant to be malicious. They were really simply due to the fact of ignorance. And so growing up, even when I moved, uh, my family moved to Michigan when I was 10, these similar questions and stereotypes and stigmas continued to follow me. Um, again, I found myself um, in a very small town. Um, and at this point in Michigan, I was one of five Indian students in my class, uh, one of them being my sister, so one of three, really. And um, one of the ways that I learned to really kind of dispel these stereotypes was to share a part of my culture. 
And I was really able to do that through, through dance. I grew up um, traveling back to India every year. My mom's side of the family still lives there. Um, and both my parents are from South India. And I grew up classically trained in an art form called Bharatanatyam. Um, and so every year, my school had a variety show. And um, since middle school, throughout high school, you better believe, my sister and I were so proud to be able to share this huge part of our ethnic background um, with our community. And I think the first time I did it, I was really nervous because I had no idea how it was going to be received because it's, it's always you know, scary when you're doing something different. Um, and the welcome that I, that I had, the positive feedback that, that we both received from my community was really amazing. Um, I remember my, my friends would say, oh my goodness, you know, what does that mean? Or, or um, your costumes are so beautiful. And just really feeling encouraged by um, my community was really amazing. And to really educate them um, about who I was and share a part of who, you know, where my family was from was really important to me. And so since then, um, I graduated, or I attended the University of Michigan, continued my um, dance art form, art form there, I suppose. I was in two student dance groups on campus. Um, that was a really fun way for me to stay connected. Um, but, you know, excuse me, I'm going to have to rewind a little bit. Before I attended um, the University of Michigan, I found myself in a position where I realized that I had to pay for a portion of my education. And my parents were very generous enough to offer to pay for half of my education, but I knew that I had to pay for a significant other half um, portion of that. And so one of my friends actually just kind of mentioned to me in passing um, that she thought I should compete in the Miss America organization. And I started competing when I was 16. I was a junior in high school at the time. Um, and in the Miss Michigan's Outstanding Teen Program. And that's a, meant to be a feeder into the Miss America program. It's for girls from the ages of 13 to 17. And so I competed and I said, okay, sure, why not? You know, I have a talent. I've, I've, I feel like I've been involved in my community, which this organization is very much based on service. And so I was honored to win the title of Miss Michigan's Outstanding Teen. And then I went on to become first runner up at Miss America's Outstanding Teen. And through competing in that, I won $25,000 in scholarship money. And that's when I think my parents thought I actually know this organization was pretty legit. <laughs> um, and so with that money and the help of my parents, I was fortunate enough to be able to graduate and stand here saying 100% debt free because of this organization and thankfully again my parents. Um, but then when I started uh, to realize that I wanted to go to graduate school, um, I started competing again in the Miss America organization. And um, every contestant in the Miss America organization is required to have a personal platform, um, a cause that they choose to champion for their year of service. And mine, there was no question, like I mentioned, that it was going to be celebrating diversity through cultural competency. And really the heart of that, is, you know, without going into a long spiel, I suppose, is that it's really not about opening a discussion about race because that hasn't necessarily proven to be effective. It's really about learning and understanding everyone's cultural beliefs, backgrounds, um, regardless of where they're from, their socioeconomic status, um, whatever it may be. It's about finding common ground and being able to understand and communicate with each other and respect one another in an open and honest manner. And that's really what it, what it really encompasses, all groups of people. And so from there, when I won the title of Miss America with that platform, um, well, I won Miss New York first and then uh, went on to win Miss America with my platform. Um, that's definitely a cause that I promote throughout this year of service, is what we call it. But in addition to that, um, Miss America has also had a partnership with promoting STEM education. And that's one of our national platforms that we promote. And so we've been working with STEM education for three years now. I'm the third Miss America, I believe. Um, and I think I'm one of the first to actually have a degree in that STEM-related field, So, which is why I'm here today, is to kind of share my STEM story. Um, because mine was certainly a different path, um, I suppose, in finding um, my journey. And I say that because I grew up in a household where, um, you know, I grew up with a family of doctors. Um, my, 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 my father's a physician, my aunts, uncles, I'm one of 17 cousins. Um, you know, more than half of them are also physicians. Um, and um, my sister is a third year in medical school right now, and she's like the golden child in my family to this day. <laughs> um, and uh, so when I was in, in middle school, I remember um, science and math came really easy to me. And I think a 
large part of that was because I remember sitting down with my mom every day after school and she would teach me ahead of my class in science and math. Um, so I was always kind of one step ahead of, of my peers and it, and it came very easily to me. But then when I went to high school, uh, really towards the end of high school, junior, senior year, I really struggled. Um, I started to really struggle um, with both my science classes and math classes. And um, I think that was because a large part of me, I was so stretched in so many different directions. Um, and while I'm certainly proud of that now, um, um, you know, I, I'm going to toot my own horn for a couple seconds, um, if I'm not already. Um, but I think I was the only um, varsity tennis player, cheerleader. I was in the marching band, color guard. Um, I was president of the student body. I was in French club and all these things, and I was also taking AP Calc BC. Um, so you can imagine my plate was extremely full, and I had really no idea of how to balance it, especially when you when you get into these higher level classes. And so because I had such a great, um, well, I also should also say that I had a very difficult time asking for help. Um, and I don't know if that's because I'm very type A and that I have to plan everything and it has to be my way, um, but it's also, I think I'm, a very shy person, <laughs> you're giggling over there. <laughs> um, it's also because I think I'm a very shy person and in school I was not the person to, to raise my hand constantly and say pick me um, and it was very difficult for me to really um, engage with, with others around me. And the best way for me to overcome that is that I had such a great, I went to such a great high school that I had great teachers who really took the initiative to reach out to me. Um, but more importantly than that, I also had, my high school offered a lot of study groups. And I think I really learned more from my peers being able to learn outside, you know, at someone's house in their basement or at a coffee shop um, and learn from them opposed and asking them questions because I was just embarrassed to ask my teachers. Um, and because I developed those skills and learned how to ask for help and find resources that were so available to me is how I think I did so well when I went to college, especially that freshman year of, of going to college. And what was really great about going to an institution like me Michigan, it was, it was also a struggle in itself is that you go from, you know, I went from a high school of 200 students in my graduating class to a university with 7,000 students in my graduating class. Um, so I was in lecture halls with six, 700 students at a time, um, and there were thousands of students enrolled in one course at a time, so you're competing with, you know, thousands and thousands of students who are equally as brilliant as you um, and who, who understand the importance of hard work. And um, when I started my freshman year, I still really wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Um, I felt more pressure than anything from my family to go into the healthcare field, and I just, I didn't know if that was, um, whether it was, if that was my parents' dreams and my family's dream or Nina's dream, and that was something I really struggled with finding. And what it really came down to was, I think, a part of me was certainly scared because um, my family, my sister had always excelled in that field. It was something that came naturally to her, I think. Um, yes, Grinch, of course, she was a hard worker, but she just got things quicker than I did. And I felt really compared to her because of that. Um, and it didn't come as quickly to me. It really didn't. And so when I went to college, I thought, you know what? I don't want to go into STEM. That's not my thing. I'm, I'm just really not that great at it. Um, that's Mina, Mina, oh, my sister's name is Mina, by the way, Nina and Mina. My parents thought it was really cute to have rhyming names. <laughs> Um, and so I said, you know, that's her thing, I'll let her do it. And so I took a, a, a wide variety of classes, especially your freshman and, and throughout your sophomore year, you have that opportunity to be able to do that, which is really great, um, because I think it is important to experiment and see what you like and see what, you, what you're good at. Um, and what it really ended up coming down to me was during my junior year, I realized that I was passionate about service. Um, and this is something that I had consistently come back to ever since I was ever since I was really young. My family had really been service oriented. Um, like I said, I was really involved in my community, um, even in college, various service organizations, groups. Um, that's just something that I did and I, and I loved to do. So my kind of path to STEM was more about the service aspect of it, especially becoming a physician, was more service oriented than it was um, science oriented. And so when I decided to actually take the plunge and say, you know what, I'm going to give this a try, 
lie, it was difficult for me, especially throughout all those weeder classes that people talk about and organic chemistry and this and that. And I survived, I made it, you know, I passed. Um, but like I said, I think just going back to the, to the um, drawing board, I suppose, in that sense, when it did get hard, I remember talking to um, other people who had taken those courses and, and specifically my sister who had asked me, well, Nina, what do you, I just said, it's too hard. How did you get through this and have a social life? Because <laughs> of course I was concerned about that. Um, and she said, well, what do you do when, when anything gets hard? What did you do if you didn't, you know, get your serve right in tennis? Or what did you do if you didn't hit the right note in, in band class? And I said, well, I practiced and I worked harder. And I think the reality of this situation is that if I wasn't staying up late and working harder, or if I wasn't getting up earlier, um, you know, if I wasn't getting up at 6 a.m. to study for an exam, I knew that there was someone else getting up at 4 a.m. doing that same thing. So just waking up every morning and understanding that I have a choice to actually make the decision to work hard um, and to pursue that dream and works but for something that I'm so passionate about. Um, and that's what I essentially do throughout this year as well. Um, uh, the, one of the, the main reasons why I even chose to compete in this organization, specifically the Miss America organization, was because it was so service-oriented. And throughout this year, I serve as a National Goodwill Ambassador for Children's Miracle Network Hospitals. And when I visit, I visit you know, dozens of hospitals across the country. And one of the best parts of my job is these children that I visit have been through dozens of, of treatments, um, have severe life-threatening illnesses, and majority of the time, they don't necessarily know who I am or what I'm even doing there, but all they think is a princess has walked into the room for a day. And to see these genuine smiles on these children's faces who have, um, and to, to hear their parents say, my daughter hasn't smiled in weeks, and this is the first smile I've seen on her face, um, because you're here is just, really makes it all, it just puts everything into perspective as to why I'm here, why I'm working towards this goal, um, and especially throughout this year as Miss America. And so in addition to serving as a National Goodwill Ambassador, I also work really closely with the Department of Education, um, promoting STEM education. I've had the opportunity to attend conferences like CGI, which is Clinton Global Initiative. Um, and it's just, if you ever have the opportunity to go, it's really incredible um, because they bring together all these world leaders, global leaders, um, talking about various, I guess, um, problems and solutions and issues, not only nationally, but globally. And I was there specifically for STEM, so I was um, with the director of the NIH, with researchers from MIT, um, just really talking about wonderful, wonderful initiatives that are going on um, in our educational system, as well as for our future in technology and medicine and healthcare as well, which was really, really amazing. Um, Another thing that I realized that after kind of pursuing my degree for medicine, um, why I decided to come back, I suppose, in, in the Miss America organization, I took about a five-year hiatus after I competed in the team program, was that I, again, found myself with no means to pay for my education um, going to graduate school. And so I competed for Miss New York twice. Um, my first year, I was second runner-up and then went on to win my second year, and spoiler alert, I won Miss America. Um, and through, through competing, I won, um, I guess my total tally at when I was thinking about this, competing throughout this organization, I've won a total of $91,000 to put towards my education. And I have 60,000 of that to put towards graduate school, um, which I say, well, maybe it'll pay for my books, but um, it's still better than nothing. And so a little bit about life after, winning Miss America. I have all these wonderful initiatives and causes that I'm doing, um, but everyone kind of wants to know the nitty gritty details, so I'm totally here to dish it out to you. Um, it's interesting because everyone thinks that Miss America is this glamorous lifestyle, um, and it's this glamorous job, and you're treated like royalty. Um, it's, it's not like that at all. <laughs> um, yes, there are certainly perks that I will get to, but um, the, the night I won, I was immediately whisked off to a press conference. I had about 20 minutes with my family and friends, and then I was asked to repack all my belongings into two suitcases. And I literally have been living out of those two suitcases that I packed that night since September. Um, I travel on average every other day. I'm usually no place longer than 48 hours. Um, so I never know where, you know, every day is so different. Not every, every event is so different. And so I can be, you know, one day with kindergartners um, to 
uh, you know, university students like yourselves to businessmen, CEOs. Um, I could be lobbying on Capitol Hill, meeting with congressmen and senators. Um, so you just never know. It's the best career fair in the world, I suppose, um, having a year like this. And um, a, a couple of fun things I got to do was I had the honor to actually visit with President Obama in the Oval Office, which was really exciting and, of course, an incredible opportunity. Um, I'm also a huge football fan, college football fan, specifically Michigan. Um, so I was honored to be at the Michigan-Ohio State game this year, and we were so close. Yeah, we were so close. Um, and I was on the field, and I got to bring my family, which was really nice um, since my sister went there as well. Um, I was also at the Super Bowl, which was really cool. Um, and Steven Tyler was in my suite, um, which was even more cool. <laughs> and um, I also went to the Syracuse University basketball game. Um, I mentioned I was born in Syracuse, and we're having an awesome season, so that was cool. Um, and then I met um, Mindy Kaling, who's one of my um, greatest role models. Um, and of course, I think one of the the ice, the the, my most favorite event, which all, everyone always asks about, that I've been able to do this year is Celebration. Um, and that's an event that we do with Children's Miracle Network Hospitals. And they choose 50 children, one from each state, and they call them champion children. And they bring these children and their, and their entire family, um, their family members, and they bring them to Disney World for a week, and then we end with a tour in DC for about another week. So we're together with these families for almost two weeks, um, and I'm there the whole time as Miss America. And I genuinely didn't think this would happen, but I have walked away making friends with these families. And these are all children who, again, like I said, um, are either have overcome their um, disease or illness or are still going through treatments. Um, their stories are so empowering and um, it's, it's really sad because I remember one of, the, um, one of the family members that I was speaking with said, you know, my child isn't going to be here next year. So to just have this, these weeks to take our mind off of things, to spend it um, and, and to spend it with people who understand what he's been going through um, really makes, makes this event so incredible. And it's really true. So when I was in Texas, I was able to visit the champion family from Texas um, across my travels. And it's just, it's just been really incredible the amount of um, friendships that I've made from that one event and spending it with them. So that hands down is one of my favorites. Um, but like I said, I really wanted to just take the time to open this um, uh, open the floor to some questions and um, talk about STEM, what I'm doing um, as Miss America or my platform as well. Um, and I'm just really looking forward to a great conversation. So I want to thank you all for having me. Thank you so much. Um, I am not Dr. Beverly Walker Grafia, and I know that she is probably very disappointed that she didn't make it from that big meeting. Um, so I, I will step in for her and, and uh, deal with the, the question part of this. Um, we've come to that portion of the program where we do get to ask you questions. Um, you'll notice that there are standing microphones in the aisles, so if you have questions, you can line up on either, in either of the aisles. Um, before turning it over to all of you, I'd like to ask the first question. Um, there are many young women who may have an aptitude for STEM, the, a STEM field, um, and they may even want to pursue that STEM field, but there's that peer pressure not to be, and I'm not using the script now, not to be a nerd, a geek. Um, there's bullying, there's teasing that often uh, young women don't want to deal with. What would you say to those young women, and what do you think Montgomery College personnel can do um, to help you with these cases? Thank you. Absolutely, um, and, and one of the things when I'm in high schools that I really like to talk about is that, first and foremost, I'm living testament of you can have it all um, in that sense of you can be smart, you can be um, talented, intelligent, articulate, and you can be beautiful. There's nothing wrong with that um, to cultivate those talents and skills that you have. Um, and especially in high schools, I always say that I promise you no one will care 10 years from now, you know, 
what designer jeans you wore or shirt you wore or how popular you were. Um, and the only thing that will matter is your GPA, the college you went to, and the education and degree that you have and what you've done with it. Because education is the, is the key to success. And if I didn't have that solid background, I wouldn't have any credibility for this year as to what I'm doing. Um, and I think it's really been hard because when I walk into a room, oftentimes people will see me and think, oh, you know, Miss America, that's great. You know, she's cute. She's whatever it may be. But I've always made it a point to present myself from an academic standpoint because I am so proud of, of being able to represent what I think is reflective of the American young women today. Um, and that's being intelligent first and foremost. And I think for young girls, um, it's it's kind of difficult when we, we're talking about that nerd and and that 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 word, which I don't like, um, because I kind of view myself that way. Um, not only am I, I guess, a nerd, but I also really like Star Wars and Star Trek and Harry Potter and all that, all that good stuff. Yeah, awesome. You two back there. <laughs> um, and I think that we also really need to, for colleges and universities, really. Um, expose young ladies to what STEM-related fields are, because there are so many STEM-related fields that we don't know of, and, and that's something I'm even learning this year. Um, this past year, I visited the world headquarters of Whirlpool, and um, the, I was touring there, and the woman um, who was the lead design um, designer for all the finishes of Whirlpool appliances, um, all the colors, the patterns, the um, all the uh, like steel and the the word I'm looking for I guess tactile um, is was was a woman and that's and she went to fashion school um, and then tr transitioned to this STEM related field which is something I never would have thought of. Um, another thing that any young girl can relate to is cosmetics. Um, as Miss America, we have a cosmetic sponsor, Rain, and um, I had the opportunity to go into the lab and make my own lip gloss. Um, and people don't think of STEM like that because here we are, two two women in a lab creating something, making something. And I think if high schools and um, starting in high school, if they really exposed our young ladies uh, to more experiments, to more hands-on things, to getting them to think outside of the box of what STEM is because it's all so connected, it's all so intertwined, um, to find your passion and to follow it. Um, and, and I think um, people will be surprised as to how much STEM that, that really is. Bueller? <laughs> you know, it's really interesting that um, I tell this story that when people ask me that question, um, it's all often one of the first questions which I find interesting um, because, um, you know, here I am standing here promoting all these wonderful causes, um, doing so much service work, um, and I've done so much service work, and I've had questions thrown at me um, like, oh, so can you cook? Or, uh, you know, do you have a boyfriend? And to me, it's just, uh, you know, it's, 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 um, it's unfortunate that our society asks so many questions like that um, when I'm here doing so much more than that. Um, and I'm here um, advocating, spending my year um, promoting a lot of causes that are important to me. And I really like to stay and focus on that more than anything else. Nina, thank you very much for a terrific presentation. You're very lively and very beautiful. and but you're in touch with yourself. Thank you. It sounds to me like you became very much in touch with yourself in your third year, and <laughs> that's where your passion really showed. I think as a father of nine and a grandfather of 23, oh, I'm looking for a secret. Uh, <laughs> how, how do we turn these kids on early? And in looking back in your life, how do you think what would have helped you turn on earlier. You were generally in touch with service, mm -hmm. but how could we have alerted you earlier so you would have gotten up at 4 a.m. earlier in your life <laughs> and gotten the education you needed? Thank right. You. Um, well, I can honestly attribute all of that to my parents. Um, I had, you know, my parents really pushed me um, the hardest that they could, and there were at times where it was really difficult for me, and um, at times I certainly resented them for it because I just didn't understand the big picture. 
I suppose. And um, I think there's definitely certainly a healthy balance that parents can find with their children in terms of encouraging them and pushing them. Um, but for me, I really felt like I just, I, I mean, it was expected um, and of me to, to be doing that, to be that focused. Um, I suppose inherently kind of finding it on my own was my junior year of college, really. Um, and I think college is really the time that you develop yourself as a person. Um, and when I went away, it was kind of exciting for me because it was the first time I was unleashed into the world and be able to do what Nina wanted to do when you don't have your parents um, with you 24-7. And so for me, it was just a time of, of um, exploring things. And when it came down to... Um, knowing who I was, I suppose, um, there was a point where I really shied away from my culture, um, shied away from my heritage, and um, college was kind of that time when I rediscovered that. And a large part of that um, was, for me, was really through dance. Um, it has been something, and I really wish that STEM, and I think it's kind of turning into this, um, would change to STEAM <laughs> to add the arts <laughs> into it, um, because I think that's equally as important. Um, and the arts really discipline you in certain ways that, uh, you know, a, a science tech book just simply can't um, and so really staying connected with that was I think what really helped me kind of discover myself and stay in tune with that and really helped me focus on what I wanted uh, I'm, I'm just curious I'm not clear of where you are in school and I'm also curious about what city and state your family was from originally in India. Yeah, uh, well actually I graduated in 2011. I did a post back um, for a year and a half um, at Syracuse and I, that's when I um, finished the remaining of my requirements for medical school um, and then took the MCAT right in April of 2013 and then I competed for, I was actually in the process of applying for medical school in 2013, the summer of, um, but this past year I won Miss New York and I was actually still applying even when I won Miss New York in July. Um, and then September rolled around <laughs> and um, when I won Miss America, I made the decision to withdraw all my applications. Um, there was no way I was going to be able to finish my secondaries. Um, so just a little side note, when you apply for medical school, um, you have your first round of applications that you submit, and then if they like you or if you meet their credentials, then you have fill out secondary applications, um, which are more essays and things particular to that school. Um, and I just didn't have the time to realistically do that. Um, and it's actually a blessing in disguise because now I'll start applying again um, in the May of this year, and to add Miss America on my resume certainly sets me apart amongst the candidates. <laughs> Um, so we'll, we'll see where I end up, but um, my parents are originally from, uh, my mom is from Vijaywada, that's in Andhra Pradesh um, in, in India, um, and my dad is from a very small town um, that I actually don't know the name of, and I don't think exists anymore, so, <laughs> yeah. Did you have any other hands-on experiments before high school, and if you did, what were they like? Hands-on experience with what? Like, making things? Making things? <laughs> well, I was really involved with Science Olympiad. Um, yeah, are you, do you know what that is? Kind of, sort of. Um, well, I, I loved it because Science Olympiad was a really great way. Um, you compete in various different events that are science-related events. Um, and I always did this thing called Tinker Toys where you would build something and then a partner had to rebuild it based on your instructions. Um, and there are other various um, events uh, with uh, astrology and and, um, and and just so many different fields that I was able to do. And I loved it because it felt like a game more than actual um, science, I suppose, but you're learning at the same time. So that's something that I really did um, that exposed me to different fields. Astronomy, excuse me, not astrology. <laughs> well, there's a lot more to a person than just... Well, I first and foremost viewed myself as a businesswoman, and I think that's really important, especially in today's society, to break that glass ceiling, and it's certainly happening. And even being in this role, when I went into my interview for Miss America, I had to set myself apart amongst 14 
thousand people who applied for this job. And I went in thinking that I am applying for the CEO of a nonprofit, which is what we are. Um, and that's who we've always been. And to be the face of this organization is what Miss America does. I am out every day representing this organization. And oftentimes, I'm the only impression that people have of who Miss America is. And so to be, first and foremost, a businesswoman is what I was really after. And to market myself in a way um, where I could stay true to who I was, have that Indian heritage and culture, but also say, I'm first and foremost American, and this is, I am what is representative of America today. Oh, yeah, your microphone. Yes, um, when you, as you were going through school, did you find that your parents pushed you, or, I mean, uh, it seems like now the, the kids have so much work, homework, mm -hmm. uh, just, they need to take a lot of different classes. Uh, did they push you or did you find that you could do it yourself? Uh, they definitely pushed me. Um, they definitely had a, a, a significant role in that. Um, and there was a point that I did take it on myself um, because I th obviously when you go to college, I think that's where a large part of my generation and younger suffer because we don't have um, those skills developed from a young age. And you don't have, you know, Professors don't care if you read your lecture or not. Um, that's, that's on you to do it. And so um, for me, I think what, what's, what I've noticed across my travels, and I think, um, and myself included, is that my generation, and myself included, like I said, I'm not excluded from this, um, has so much apathy for what is going on in the world around us. I think from a young age, we were handed so much. We were given so much. Um, we had cell phones when we were like 10. Um, well, 16 for me, but getting younger and younger now. Um, and to have that mentality to go out and seek something and work hard for something is very different mentality than sitting back and thinking, oh, it's just going to be handed to me. It's just going to be given to me. And I think that's what we're losing is that idea and work ethic that our parents had because they understood what it meant. Um, and especially hearing that so often in my household um, was something that my parents instilled in me from a very young age. Yeah. What kind of community service things did you do? I did a lot of things. Um, one of my favorites when I was in high school was the Adopt-A-Grandparent program. Um, I worked very closely with that. I'm very close with my grandparents. Um, and so that was something I really enjoyed to do. I also did a lot of hospice. Um, just a lot of different things. I was in National Honor Society, so we were required to do community service events. Um, but it was just something that I really loved. Um, so I, um, I just found what I loved and, and had fun doing it. What is your take for calling hardworking, seriously studying, sincere students who want to work hard in their academic study and achieve something to be called nerds? And what is your advice for many youngsters who get to hear that word when they are attempting to achieve something to get out of that uh, and then continue to do what you did right. and become a marvelous uh, model and a successful person in the world? Well, I have a message to both parties in that sense. And the first is the person, if you're being called a nerd, that person calling you nerd guaranteed will probably be working for you in 20 years. Um, um, but realistically, more importantly to the other person, the people in terms of bullying and name calling, which I see so often in school, something I experienced, um, and I always share this personal story when I get a chance, um, especially to younger, younger people, is that um, when I was in sixth grade, or fifth or sixth grade, there was a young boy who said, oh my goodness, Nina Davalori has a bigger mustache than my dad. Um, yeah, it's, it's funny now, and it was probably true, um, but it didn't mean that it hurt any less. And I always ask them, how do you want to be remembered? Because even standing in this role um, today as Miss America or um, you know, that's what I will forever remember him for. And he can be the next um, president, CEO, um, senator, and I will forever remember him for making that one comment. And so just to understand that your words have so much power, and every time you speak, you are influencing someone. And you can either choose to be influenced in a positive way or a negative way. All right, um, I'm a parent of a middle schooler and a, a parent of a son who's eight years old. 
and I struggle with the um, tiger mom syndrome kind of a thing, like put, a, put them in this, put them in this, put them in this, <laughs> let's see what sticks kind of a thing. But do you know if your service orientation is more nature or nurture? Do, you know, did you see it? Did you feel that your parents can tell you they saw it like when you were four? And do you look at the kids and you say, oh, they're playing with Legos, they're construct or destruct, they should go into engineering or they should go into, you know, right. is that something that we should like look towards, the nature part of it? You know, I can't say for sure. Um, I think it was a combination of everything for me because like you, my parents put us in everything. I mean, everything. And it was kind of, well, let's see what they're good at or let's see what sticks or let's see what they're interested in. And so I was really thankful that, yes, I was be able to be exposed to so many different things, but they kind of let me take the lead on what it was I really liked doing. And I think that certainly helped. Um, and um, taking your child's you know, thoughts and opinions into consideration definitely helped um, help me grow, I think, in my family. Hi, um, what subject did you, uh, can you hear? Yeah, I can uh, hear. Um, what subject did you struggle with most in school and how did you get through it? The subject in high school or college or both? Uh, high school. High school. Um, the subject I struggled with the most Honestly, biology. Um, chemistry was something that came so easily to me, and physics as well um, clicked easier for me. Um, but biology, oh my goodness. Um, I just, it was, it was tough for me um, to understand the processes and not only understanding, but I think I had a problem more with applying um, the material was what I noticed. Um, and that's something that I had to work really hard for. Um, and, and I spent the most time, I think, um, on biology than anything else. And I say that it's kind of ironic that I'm going to medicine, but you win some, you lose some. <laughs> oh, yes. Hi. Hi. Well, the nation is proud of you, I'm sure. I just want to reassure you that Indian community at large takes ownership of you in, <laughs> in so many ways and have Thank been you. cheering you on. Uh, one thing that I would like to ask you, you come from a very affluent and educated family, which uh, definitely helps mm -hmm. when educating you. How do you suggest STEM working for individuals that are in inner city that don't even know the word, that will come to school, have potential, but really don't have the guidance? Right. Who do they turn to? Well, I've even, I, there have been times where I've had, I obviously have role models, and one of mine is Sonia Sotomayor, the first um, Hispanic woman Supreme Court Justice, um, was raised, born and raised in the Bronx, um, put herself through her, through education, through law school, who I admire so much. Um, but one of the other um, people that I've met this year across my travels was at um, this, this uh, convention called Education Nation. Um, and they bring together students, teachers, um, advisors, and it's this one conference in New York City, and we talk about our educational system, problems and solutions that we can, um, that we can solve together. And um, just sitting there hearing this young gentleman's story, he was a freshman at Harvard. Um, and he, very, you know, very similar, grew up in inner city schools, um, and he was um, thinking, considering really, um, I think it was, he felt pressured to join a gang because that was all he knew. Um, that was all he was exposed to in his community and environment. And he had a teacher, actually, take him and drive him around to these lovely neighborhoods in his community just five, ten minutes away from where he was living. Um, and he said, you know, I remember asking my teacher, well, what do these people do? How do they live in such nice houses? How do they um, have this lifestyle that, that's within, you know, so close to my home, but so different in our lifestyles? Um, and she said, well, you know, this person is a physician, or this person is a lawyer or engineer. And he said, it, it was just my moment of realization that all of these people were highly educated, and that was my key to getting out. 
and to hear his story, and I think the best part of his story was that, um, you know, he obviously, you know, he said that his mother definitely helped in that sense, um, really provided a safe environment for him. Um, but the best part of his story is that he said, you know, Harvard it wasn't my first choice. <laughs> he said, he said, you know, I, he's like, MIT was my first choice, but I knew that if I wasn't going to get into MIT, I was going to get into Harvard, and if not Harvard, then Yale. Um, and just to hear that story with all these children around um, kind of in you know some of them in, in, in the same path he was in is so inspiring um, and I think if we have more teachers to be able to take that initiative to help our students to guide them um, is can it can really make a world of a difference and hearing him share his story even impacted myself even at this age we have time for two more questions the young lady in the white scarf and the young lady in the pink jacket so you were talking about the pressures of being in like a family of physicians and I feel the same way and like how your sister is like the golden child. <laughs> I have a, I'm in the exact same position. <laughs> how like my family has lawyers, doctors, nurses, whatever, and I don't even know what I'm gonna do with my life. Mm -hmm. So I just wanna know how you deal with the pressures of being in a family that's so like successful and yeah. they pressure you to be a certain kind of person. It was d definitely difficult. And I think that's why being in this role, entering this organization was something that really gave me a sense of validity that I had never had before. Um, because you don't see a lot of Indian people in this kind of field. Um, you don't see a lot of ethnic people, for that matter, in this kind of field. And for me, what it really came down to, I remember speaking, talking with my sister, who, I'm, who who's my best friend, um, and it was, you know, I had been give, gifted with so many talents. Um, speaking doesn't come easily to people. Um, you know, I have, I had, I've, I've, I'm a good dancer. And for me, I really wanted to share those talents with people. I loved performing. I loved being on stage. I had a message that I wanted to send. Um, and I remember sitting down with my family, really, and them saying to me, well, what are you really going to get out of this organization? Why are you doing this? Go to med school right away. Go to med school right away. Um, and I said to them, how many, and I think it's hard because I totally understand what you're saying because I can't tell you how many times my family has said to me, not only my parents, but my family, you know, my aunts, uncles, etc., has said to me, oh, well, so-and-so just got into this school. So-and-so just, you know, is doing this and that. And I remember sitting down with my family saying, how many people, how many so-and-sos do you know can call themselves Miss America? Like, give me a break here. Um, and so for me, just kind of following this path of something that I knew that I was really good at um, and I felt at home and comfortable doing, and thankfully I did have such a wonderful family, um, as difficult as they have been at times, um, to be supportive um, in everything that I've done. And um, even if they didn't necessarily agree with it from the get-go, I think at the end of the day, your parents really genuinely want you to be happy. And they will surprise you because they've certainly surprised me so many times. Um, and so really just our journey together has really helped our relationship grow because they've um, allowed, they've actually really trusted me to make the decisions for myself. Um, and I think when they see you at that standpoint where they realize that they've raised you well with the morals and values and beliefs that you have, and you, at some point they kind of have to trust your judgment. After you became Miss America, um, what other type of places did you go? Well, I first went to New York City and did a media tour. Then I've been to, um, I did a tour in Canada. I went to London for two days. Um, and then, let's see, I was in Orlando, D.C., L.A. Um, I'm heading out to Denver um, to uh, do a taping of Extreme Weight Loss. I'll be on that, which, is, which I'm really excited about. Um, and uh, just, gosh, so many things um, that I've been able to do this year that's been really exciting. Um, but I think the coolest place, definitely, hands down, was the Oval Office. <laughs> But with that, I just want to thank you all so much for having me. You guys are a great crowd. Thank you. Well, we want to give Nina another hand because she has done a wonderful job for us again.
I'm Dr. Beverly Walker Grafia. I'm the Senior Vice President for Student Services here, and I'm representing the president tonight that wanted to share her regards to Nina and wish that she could be here, but we had a conflicting board meeting, and so she was unable to be here. But I wanted to ask Nina just one final thing, if she would speak to. We are, in persons that know Montgomery County and know Montgomery College, we are a very diverse student body. Uh, and we pride ourselves on being a student body and a college that embraces diversity. And so I would like for you to speak to uh, our students today about really what are your thoughts about the importance of diversity and achievement? Absolutely. Um, as I mentioned, my platform was celebrating diversity through cultural competency. And I think one of the biggest things that I've really been exposed to this year is what happened immediately after I won um, Miss America. And everyone's always a little curious to ask about it. Um, and I'm glad you brought it up, actually. Um, and so if, if any of you are familiar with it, immediately after I won, I was kind of hit with this um, negative feedback, I suppose, from the Twitter sphere, which is never happy. Um, and um, I had a lot of comments, uh, right comments that were said about um, about my being in this role I suppose and I truly think you know the silver lining with everything that happened that I that I'm happy to be able to stand here and advocate for is that for every one negative comment tweet or post there were hundreds if not thousands of positive words of encouragement and support um, from not only Americans um, but people globally all across the world I really felt that um, and to see students really stand up from various universities I had students at Yale University um, create this we are Miss America campaign of everyone of different backgrounds and ethnicities saying that there were students at Duke University who created this stand with Nina video um, and it was them talking about this kind of discussion and, and race in our culture today. And I see it changing. I see it changing with younger generations. Um, and to be able to create this positive discussion um, in colleges, high schools, universities, to see people tweet me um, papers that they've written about this um, and, and, and hearing them learn about this in college and create this discussion has been so, so incredible. Because regardless or not, you know, we, we live in a world, we live in a country that's not as simple as black and white anymore. And that's the reality of the situation. And what we have to do to move forward is to be able to communicate with each other and respect one another. And I'm not sitting here saying that we all have to agree with everyone's beliefs because that kind of kumbaya isn't realistic or, um, and, and that's not ideal. But um, there is a way to communicate and respect each other in an open and honest manner. Um, and from an educational setting, from a business setting, you have to be able to work with people um, and you're going to continue to work with those people throughout your life um, so embracing that learning about it is really the best way we can educate ourselves for our future generations thank you this concludes our program thank you so very much for coming out tonight